people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers. Tonight on Primetime, the roommate accused of helping her boyfriend kill a Clark Atlanta student could get out on bond, but Alexis Crawford's family says that they are going to do everything they can to make sure that doesn't occur. And even as some kids head back to school during a pandemic, the CDC is warning about a potential outbreak of another virus that impacts children. And later, this 81 year old grad is proving it's never too late to achieve your goals. Why he never stopped working to get the chance to walk across the stage for a degree. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. The late Rayshard Brooks family and their legal team say they are baffled by accusations that the former Atlanta officer charged with killing Brooks went on vacation in Daytona Beach while he was out on bond. The Fulton County District Attorney is Paul Howard. He is asking for Garrett Rolfe's bond to be revoked. Now Rolfe was fired from APD and charged with murder after shooting Brooks in the parking lot of the Wendy's on University Avenue. It happened in June after Rolfe tried to arrest him for DUI. Today, the legal team for the Brooks family said leaving the state would clearly violate the conditions of Rolf's bond. They say the judge made it clear he was not supposed to leave his home for other than work, medical or legal reasons. They say it is disrespectful both to the judge and to a family still mourning the loss of their loved one. And that I was baffled when I heard about this. It was very hurtful. It let me know that Officer Ralph did not care about what the judge had laid down as well as caring about how anyone else would feel on his behalf by vacationing. Um, I'm hurt and again I'm just wondering when will justice be served? When will things change? At the same time Rolf is suing to try and get his job back with the department. In a statement, his lawyers say the city did not allow him due process or the opportunity to be heard before firing him. They've not responded to the accusations that Rolf took a vacation in Florida. Late this afternoon, Governor Kemp signed the Police Protection Act into law. The move was opposed by civil rights groups that say it tempers the state's newly signed hate crimes law. Governor Kemp issued this statement on the measure. House Bill 838 is a step forward as we work to protect those who are risking their lives to protect us while some vilify, target, and attack our men and women in uniform or personal for political gain. This legislation is a clear reminder that Georgia is a state that unapologetically backs the blue. Atlanta Mayor Bottoms issuing seven orders today designed to rein in the use of force by police. This after police shot and killed Rayshard Brooks at the Wendy's parking lot in June and an earlier situation in May when police were arrested for tasing two college students. Here's 11 Alive's Doug Richards. 
The encounter between police and protesters near Centennial Olympic Park in May escalated quickly, with officers chasing a car driven by a college student with his girlfriend. The end result, criminal charges dropped against the motorists and charges filed against the officers who deny wrongdoing. With that, plus the George Floyd case in Minneapolis and the killing of Richard Brooks by a police officer in Southeast Atlanta, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms issued orders that she hopes will restrict Atlanta police conduct without eroding police morale. APD officers took numerous sick days after the officers in the Brooks case were charged. I don't have any concerns about hamstringing police. I think if anything, it gives them a better guidance because that's something that we heard repeatedly that there was just confusion. The mayor wants the city to create guidelines that would allow officers to intervene when other officers use unreasonable force, curb retaliation against officers intervening, develop techniques to de-escalate conflicts, revise evaluations of officers, which would disincentivize certain arrests and incentivize alternatives, and create an online dashboard with ongoing use of force data and other police records. Changing the use of force guidelines will make officers lose confidence, says police union president Jason Segura. That, that becomes dangerous. If you don't want us to arrest people who resist, then we just need the mayor to tell us don't arrest people who resist. We'll follow that order. It's not going to make the city safer, but it's going to make officers' jobs a lot clearer. Mayor Bottoms says new curbs on use of police force are a work in progress, but she says they are necessary to regain trust in communities that have become wary of police. Your 11 Alive storm trackers have been tracking some pop-up showers and storms this afternoon, and some of them have produced some very strong winds. This one that's over here, just northeast of Athens now, moving up towards 85, is producing some 40 to 50 mile per hour winds, and it's actually broken into two here with the other cell moving in through Alberton and getting ready to cross over uh, Lake Hartwell very, very shortly. So we've had those storms here. The one near Athens producing five strikes of lightning in the past 15 minutes and some very heavy downpours as well. The cell we've been watching near Cedartown really just kind of hung up stationary and now is raining itself out. So it's not even going to make it to Floyd County like we thought that it probably could. So uh, things are quieting down there in the northwest corner. But here in the northeast corner, things could stay active for a while. We still have that uh, Storm Prediction Center center level one severe weather risk across northeast Georgia yet this evening because that's the area we'll likely see strong to severe storms form. We have a frontal boundary that is pulled up stationary, lots of moisture out there, and it has been more unsettled throughout the southern Appalachian mountain chain throughout this afternoon and evening, and it looks like it's going to be that way tomorrow as well. So coming up, we'll time out your storms that you can expect to see tomorrow and what you can expect for this very hot, steamy weekend ahead. All right, Sam, thank you. One of the people accused in the murder of a Clark Atlanta student could soon be released on bond. 21-year-old Alexis Crawford was killed last October. Jordan Jones was Crawford's roommate and close friend at the time. In January, a grand jury indicted Jones and her boyfriend on murder charges. Attorneys for Jones will argue for her to be released on bond during a hearing set for tomorrow. Our Joe Hinkey has a response tonight from Crawford's family. The death of our beloved, beautiful, brilliant, and loving Alexis Janae Crawford has devastated every aspect of our lives. Reverend Markel Hutchins this afternoon read a statement from Alexis Crawford's family after learning Jordan Jones, who was previously denied bond, will have a hearing Thursday where a judge will reconsider bond. I cannot imagine a judge granting Jordan the freedom to walk around until her trial while Alexis will never get to walk around anywhere ever again. Investigators say Jones, who was Crawford's close friend and roommate, strangled and suffocated Crawford and then dumped her body in the wooded area of Exchange Park in Decatur. Jones's boyfriend, Baron Brantley, also charged in the attack and murder, in addition to being charged with sexually assaulting Crawford days earlier. A grand jury indicted the pair in January and they pleaded not guilty in February, though detectives say they admitted to at least parts of the crime when questioned. And to now think that a judge could potentially grant a bond to Jordan Jones for killing Alexis Crawford is just unimaginable and pours salt into those wounds. 
A court filing shows the argument Jones' defense attorneys are expected to make. The filing reads, this defendant has no criminal history beyond a prior misdemeanor charge, has ties to the community, has no record or history of ever having threatened or intimidated anyone in her life, and has no indication that she is any type of flight risk. Upon the request of the Atlanta Police Department prior to the filing of any charges, the defendant returned to Atlanta from Detroit, Michigan, and voluntarily assisted them in their investigation. And Crawford's mother says two of her other children also attend college in Atlanta. If Jones is granted bond and leaves jail, she would consider pulling her two children out of school over safety concerns. Jones's hearing is scheduled for 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon in Fulton County Superior Court. We'll bring you any updates on the hearing on 11alive.com. Paulding County School District investigating after a video surfaced appearing to capture someone using a racial slur in a virtual classroom. A viewer sent us a copy of the video, which they say was shared on Snapchat. The district says it appears this is a Paulding County virtual class, and because those classes are compromised of students from up to five schools, they're still working to identify those individuals who may be involved. A Georgia representative is joining efforts to help find a missing man with dementia. Atlanta police are asking for help finding Lazarus Parker. He was last seen Friday morning around 11 near Glenview Circle and Valley Ridge Drive. Today, his family passed out flyers in the Mechanicsville area, hoping someone may have information. Representative Hank Johnson is a friend of Parker's and is pleading for help. He says Parker's dementia has gotten so bad he had to <coughs> leave his job at MARTA and doesn't recognize his son. There's a $1,000 reward in this case. Doctors want parents to know about a rare illness. Looks a little bit like polio. It's devastating to children. The CDC says it could impact kids in larger numbers this winter. We'll talk to Dr. Sujatha Reddy, our medical correspondent, coming up next. And don't forget, we are streaming right now on our 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe and get in on the conversation right now in the community section. There's more 11 Alive news in prime time after this break. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. Tonight, we are learning about new cases of COVID-19 within the Cherokee County School District, plus a teacher now showing symptoms. At Hasty Elementary Fine Arts Academy, a first grader has tested positive. Ten students and a teacher must quarantine for two weeks. An eighth grade student at Dean Rusk Middle School also tested positive. Fifteen students there must quarantine for two weeks. And an entire kindergarten class at RM, at RM Moore Elementary School must now quarantine for 14 days after a teacher began showing symptoms and was in close contact with someone who tested positive for coronavirus. This comes as the debate on whether or not students should go back to school amid the pandemic continues. But one Cherokee County mom says there isn't a right or wrong answer. Our Elwin Lopez spoke with her today. Parents in Cherokee County, like many others across the state, had a tough decision to make this school year amid the pandemic. 
The district says the majority, 78% of families opted for in-person learning. One parent told us she opted for in-person because she didn't think there was enough support for honors and AP classes through the virtual academy, saying it didn't leave her with much of a choice. Liz Trowbridge, who has an 11-year-old at Creekland Middle and a 16-year-old at Creekview High, also among those opting for in-person. The caution is there, um, but this is the best thing for my kids is to go face to face instead of virtual learning. Trowbridge says her high schooler saw just about half of her peers wearing masks. And while she doesn't believe masks should be mandated for kids, she does want to see educators explain why they are recommended. Making the kids more aware of how important wearing a mask is and why we're doing this instead of just put it on, you know, it's required kind of thing. On Monday, the district says it was notified that a second grader who attended Sixes Elementary had tested positive for the virus, adding that the child didn't start feeling sick until after the school day was over. And that's when the parents sought a COVID-19 test. Images that were posted and then deleted from the school and district's social accounts show students close together with some not wearing masks. Trowbridge says the worry is there, but the good for her family outweighs the bad, and every family needs to choose what's best for them. It's okay to make the choice that you feel is right for your family. We're all in this together, and we want the best for our families. A Cherokee County School District spokesperson said that other than the Sixes Elementary students, there have been no other COVID-19 cases. She says that they update their status report on Fridays. Well, if you're still wondering about back to school plans in your district, just text the word school to the number on your screen. We'll send you a guide of each district's plan. The CDC is warning about a potential climb in the cases of a neurologic condition that looks a little bit like polio, and it can have serious health consequences long term for children. Cases peak every other year, and although the illness is rare, 2018 saw the highest number of cases ever recorded at 238. We talk with 11 Alive medical correspondent Dr. Sujatha Reddy to talk about what parents need to know. The signs and symptoms to look for are going to be things that look like an upper respiratory infection. Your child seems to have like a runny nose, that type of thing, possibly a fever. And while those are signs of coronavirus and the run of the mill cold, what you'll see more with acute flaccid myelitis is going to be things affecting their nervous system. They may have trouble walking. They may say their arms and legs are tired or don't work right. They seem weak. You may notice that they're having trouble, you know, speaking. They can also cause headache, backache, things like that. We don't want parents to be scared to bring their children to the doctor's office or an urgent care or an emergency room if they're showing signs of something that could be serious for the fear of coronavirus. The hospitals and doctor's offices are taking lots of precautions to protect us once we're in there. And there's some things that are gonna need to be evaluated by a healthcare professional. Dr. Reddy says the CDC wants people to know the signs and symptoms of the virus because the earlier doctors catch it, the easier it is to treat. CDC officials say they do not know how the COVID-19 pandemic will impact any possible outbreak. Here 11 Alive Storm Trackers are tracking some pretty nasty showers and storms right around dinner time. Now there's not a whole lot left to track. There's some here just northeast of Athens. They were pretty fierce as they rolled to the east side of town, and now they're moving up to the northeast with fewer strikes of lightning, just three in the past 15 minutes compared to about 20 that they had an hour ago. Also, Cedar Town, that storm has really fallen apart as well. It just rained itself out, which has been the nature of these showers and storms today for sure. And even here on the south side, uh, they are not nearly as numerous as they were earlier today. Butts County had a bunch of trees down, uh, six trees down, in fact, as thunderstorm winds blew them over right around the dinner hour, a little bit before. So the atmosphere is pretty moist here, especially to the south. And this area of moisture is going to be moving to the north because it is more humid on the south side of this front. And this front's going to slowly move to the north tomorrow. So we do expect things to be pretty active again during the afternoon and evening hours. For tonight, we still have the chance for level one severe. That's isolated severe storms with damaging winds, hail, lightning, heavy downpours here across far northeast Georgia. And that's where we're seeing those storms near 85 
right now, and it has been most active here near Augusta as well. So it's this northeast quadrant that appears to be the most active right now. Looking out over uh, the ballpark here on the northwest side of 285 and 75, the sun has just peaked behind those clouds, or ducked behind the clouds, I should say. The sun will set at 834 tonight, so a few clouds, remnant clouds from thunderstorms, making for an interesting sunset there. 91 was our high, our low was 74, pretty mild start to the day, or warm, sticky start to the day, I should say. We should be around 89 and 71, so we were a little above on both counts, and we did pick up a little under a tenth of an inch of rain as those storms came through the middle of town right during drive time. So we're looking at temperatures right now that have cooled in Blairsville at 72, 76 in Clayton. It's 77 in Carrollton, and we're in the mid-80s in Atlanta. And overnight tonight, we'll see the chance for storms popping up early in the morning, maybe a shower or two early in the morning, not so much a storm, but an isolated downpour is possible. And then as we head into our Thursday, a 30% chance of showers and storms, mainly during the afternoon and evening, but we could see some early morning little showers uh, before we get the day really going. And then lots of sunshine and really heating up into the low 90s once again with the chance for showers and storms during the afternoon. So here's the timing for the rest of tonight. Those few isolated showers and storms moving to the northeast, so you still could run into a downpour or two yet this evening. By about midnight, things should quiet down for the most part, but future radar is showing a few early morning showers here, particularly in the northwest side, perhaps near Rome at daybreak. And then as we head in through the rest of the day, we'll likely see a lot showing up here on the radar in terms of some downpours. We could see some heavy downpours here in some spots. This is 630, and it's looking like the mountains could be fairly active, and we'll see the isolated activity continue throughout the later evening hours, and then again, a quiet start to Friday, maybe some mountain fog or fog in the high country, and then we'll end up seeing more showers and storms. This is 2 o'clock, and then as we roll it forward here into the evening, just some isolated activity to look for. So a 30% chance on your Thursday and Friday. We think a little bit lower chance on Saturday. It's heating up, though. We're going to be in the low to mid 90s across north georgia as we head in through this weekend so you're going to have to find some way to safely keep your cool i like a sprinkler personally at 81 years old prescott lawrence has all of the life experience anyone would ever need born in 1938 when the cost of an average house was just under four thousand dollars this weekend, he will fulfill his dream and receive his college degree. It's a dream that took more than a decade to achieve. 11 Alive's Brittany Klein-Peter spoke with Lawrence about what it took to finally get to this moment. The age is a number. You're only as old as you feel, and I feel pretty young when I'm with the kids at school. 81-year-old Prescott Lawrence will graduate this weekend from Georgia Gwinnett College with a business degree and become the oldest student to ever graduate from the school. I've been taking two, maybe three courses a semester and summer's off. Unlike his much younger classmates, he says he didn't seek a college education out of necessity. It was his desire to keep learning. You learn every day. Every day there's something new to learn. So why not concentrate on something that you'd like to learn? He spent decades serving in the U.S. military. He worked several more jobs before deciding it was time to get his degree. Lawrence says he's had the support of his four children and 31 grandchildren. They're proud of them. My kids, they all say they're proud of them. Lawrence suffered an aortic aneurysm, which took him out of classes for a while, but he came back determined, and now he's receiving a degree in business administration. See that? The soon-to-be graduate has a message for those interested in going back to school. It's never too late. You learn every day. Every day there's something new to learn. Lawrence will graduate in a virtual ceremony on Saturday at 10 a.m. And as far as what's next for him, he tells me he's already working on his second degree, taking courses on the American Constitution and even Aristotle. Just to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. 
There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff. The stalemate continues between Democrats and Republicans on the next coronavirus relief bill as the $600 extra unemployment benefit program now ends. Joining me right now is Ted Jenkin, CEO of Oxygen Financial. How serious now is the unemployment situation as we roll in to August? I mean, Jeff, it's very serious nationally. It's at 11.1 percent. We're a little bit thankful here in Georgia that it's only at 7.6 percent, but that's still pretty high. Let's remember this. Since March 20th, there's been 53 million initial jobless claims in this country. And the big thing, Jeff, now is there's 18 million continuous claims. So there are many Americans that need this extra money every week. And if you consider this, more than 70% of Americans are in service-based jobs right now, Jeff, and the two R's, restaurant and retail, they have been hit really, really hard right now. In fact, Yelp had a survey that showed that 60% of the restaurants that said they were gonna temporarily shut down during the coronavirus are now going to be permanently closed. So the question is, Jeff, will there be the jobs for people to actually go back to work here? What are the proposals on the table right now? Are, are they significant? Are they helpful? Or where are we on that front? Huge stalemate right now, Jeff. Look, the average American, look, take Georgia as an example. People with the $600 were getting $965 a week. They're going to take a 65% pay cut, Jeff. How many people at work, if they got a 65% pay cut, would even go back to work? They're going to be down to $365 a week. So Congress passed an act 75 days ago, Jeff, called the HEROES Act, that would pay Americans as an additional $600 till January of 2021. So far, all the Senate has put together in the HEALS Act is a $200 a week extra stipend and then something that would take you to about 70% of your overall wages. There was a proposal last week from Mitt Romney that started the unemployment at $500 and it would scale down to $300 by October. But it's a huge stalemate right now because one camp thinks people are eating Cheetos and playing video games and are at home. And, and the other camp really wants to have this money in people's hands and they're worried about Americans being out on the street. Look, here's the concern too. I mean, the government cannot be paying this indefinitely. I mean. That, that also will take a huge toll on this country economically. We have to get people back to work. Look, uh, I'm not in politics, but I would love to see an infrastructure bill go into place, both one that's traditional infrastructure and also digital infrastructure. Try to get Americans back to work because, simply put, many of these restaurant and retail jobs I do not think are going to return anytime soon. I, I think this reboot may have changed our habits. Uh, not only in our homes, but outside as well, as, as far as the amount of money that we spend in restaurants. Uh, no question about it, Jeff. The spending is way down, and as long as the coronavirus persists, things like entertainment, hospitality, travel, and leisure, they will all continue to suffer uh, real damage here. 
Ted Jenkins, as always, thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. Every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. Today we're hearing from an Atlanta dream player whose pregame wardrobe choice made headlines. Last night, Elizabeth Williams, along with several teammates and players from other WNBA teams, wore a Vote Warnock shirt. It was a carefully crafted message in support of U.S. Senate candidate Reverend Raphael Warnock and a strong shot across the bow at Senator Kelly Leffler, a co-owner of the dream, who was hoping to hold on to her seat in Congress. Leffler has faced criticism from players for writing the WNBA commissioner opposing certain plans to honor the social justice movement. Today, Williams spoke about the players' decisions to wear the shirts. It was something that we talked through. Um, again, we wanted to be strategic. We wanted to be intentional um, about our words and our language. And we wanted to make sure that whatever action was taken in doing so, all of the, the ideas that we've been focused on weren't lost. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that this was completely player led and it was completely optional. Senator Leffler responded saying this is just more proof that the out of control cancel culture wants to shut out anyone who disagrees with them. It's clear that the league is more concerned with playing politics than basketball. And I stand by what I wrote in June. William says she and the other league players will wear the shirts again and continue to talk about social justice issues. At least six people are dead in millions without power after Tropical Storm Isaias cut a path of destruction from the Carolinas to Canada. Cleanup well underway now after the storm blew down trees and power lines, broke windows and caused widespread flooding across several states. NBC's Chris Pallone has the latest. 
Isaias may be gone, but it will be quite a while before it is forgotten. The tropical storm left a path of destruction which caused widespread flooding in Pennsylvania. Got the mud. There's mud everywhere. And it's just, it's just nasty. And brought down trees and power lines up and down the eastern seaboard. Crack, crack, crack. And went, what ooze? Straight through their house. I was completely scared. Isaias is being blamed for several deaths, including one in New York City, where a tree fell on a parked car and killed the driver sitting inside. A tornado right outside my window. The storm even spawned several tornadoes. It was crazy. See it forming right in front of you. It's like, what? At its height, Isaias knocked out power to millions. The outage, the second worst ever in the history of the power company, which serves New York City. The state's governor has launched an investigation into several utility companies accusing them of being unprepared for the storm. A similar situation unfolding in Connecticut where it could be days before all the power is back on. We're going to do everything we can to get power up as soon as we can. Isaias is now deep into northern Canada. The cleanup in the U.S. now underway. As the school year begins, a number of families are overwhelmed when it comes to virtual learning. The Boys and Girls Club is hoping to help by reopening its doors to allow students to come in and learn virtually. Here's Nick Sturdivant reporting. This is a pivot for the Boys and Girls Club. Many of the staff are not teachers, but they are determined to help out parents. You know, for a majority of students, they have to learn virtually because of this pandemic. Yeah. So for the Boys and Girls Club, what options are you guys providing to help parents and families? Beginning on August 17th, we're gonna be opening up some of our clubs again. Um, we have been working with our families over the last few months during this closure and staying connected with them. And we're hoping to especially be there for families um, who may not have a place for their kid um, during this distance learning phase. David Jernigan is the president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club in Metro Atlanta, overseeing 20 clubs over several counties. The Boys and Girls Club in Metro Atlanta helps about 2,500 children across the area in underserved communities. With this new plan to help, he says clubs will operate at 25% capacity. We'll probably be in the six to 700 range um, of kids coming through our doors. We'll have a lot of measures in place to protect them. Our kids and staff will be wearing um, a mask, and of course, we'll have all the, the cleanings and those sorts of procedures in place. We'll keep kids in small pods throughout the day with an eight to one staff to kid ratio, um, and those eight kids will travel together um, so we don't have a lot of mixing. That's 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, that's a full day. <laughs> That's, yeah. a, that's a big, big responsibility. I mean, I, I will say when we went out to our staff and we started engaging with them and asking about reopening, they were the ones that challenged us as leaders. And this is not our traditional model. Our program during the day will be largely supporting kids in their virtual instruction. Um, and then, as I said, wrapping around other programs and activities. If they are in a district where the school doors have, have physically opened, our services will be focused on serving kids as an after-school uh, service. Jernigan says staff will be trained on safety protocols and supporting virtual learners. And I will say that the districts around us have really stepped up and they're offering to do a number of things to support us. Everything from sending in you know, IT support to help us figure out how we support the kids um, to even potentially sending in instructional support. The plan is to serve members first, then to branch out. This comes with a big price tag. They don't usually keep doors open eight hours a day. It's costing them several hundred thousand dollars more compared to previous years. We want to see your back to school photos, whether it's virtual or in person. Send them to us using the Near Me section of our app. Here's how you can do that. All you have to do is click on the Near Me button in the bottom right corner. Next, tap the orange Share With Us button, then upload your photo or video. Fill out the boxes, hit Submit, and you are already done. We might use your pictures on the big broadcast. The Georgia Department of Corrections is responding to video obtained by 11 Alive from inside Ware State Prison, where several inmates and staff were injured over the weekend. Next in primetime, what they had to say about accusations of inhumane conditions. Well, looks like we're getting a little bit of a breather after Hurricane Isaias made landfall earlier in the week. So now just a 10% chance that this disturbance could develop into our next tropical system. But some rather shocking predictions coming from Colorado State University today in terms of what we can expect the rest of the season. So you want to stay tuned for that.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe. Tonight, the Georgia Department of Corrections is responding to accusations of poor conditions inside Ware State Prison. After exclusive video we shared with you last night appears to show inmates with no running water, little food, and begging for power. This comes just days after a violent attack inside the prison that left two guards and three inmates with injuries. 11 Alive's Hope Ford re received this exclusive video showing the conditions inside and a warning some of you may find this video disturbing. It was two day August 4th. Time is 112, as they say on the clock out there. Cell phone video apparently from inside Ware State, State Prison, an inmate describing the current conditions. They have cut the power off, they have cut everything off. The video shows the toilet not flushing, no water from the sink. No water coming up. He claims inmates haven't had a shower in a week and very little food. We had one scoop of ice a day, and if we might get that. Reason we ride, reason why the ride pop, because of health issues. In a second video, you hear several inmates scream for electricity. No response. We have got no response. We have to be no doors. Keep asking for power. The new video and allegations comes after the prison went into lockdown because of a violent attack on Saturday. You can see two men on the floor with bloody clothing. We need some. Help, man. A mother of a different inmate currently inside the prison says her son called her in a panic. He was like, Mama, I love you. They go around stabbing people, they breaking loose. The mother wanted to remain anonymous and says she hasn't heard from her son or the Department of Corrections since Saturday's lockdown. Fearful because you don't know if your child is going to make it. The mother wants the department to do something to help staff and improve conditions inside the prison. And that puts the workers in danger because of what's going on with the inmates, and it's not fair to either one of them. 
The Georgia Department of Corrections has since pushed back on some of the claims made by inmates and families. The agency says the facility did not lose power at any point. Inmates are being provided meals daily and during lockdown, they are being escorted to and from the showers. Now, as for the toilets not working, the department says maintenance staff is checking each cell and additional staff has been assigned to the prison to help with day to day operations. The 11 Alive storm trackers thankful for a little bit of a lull in the action in the tropics, even though we are watching that little disturbance that has a potential tropical cyclone west of Bermuda, but it only has a 10% chance of strengthening at this time. And it looks pretty quiet for now. However, uh, Colorado State University came out with their latest predictions for the season ahead. Uh, looking at the overall state of the atmosphere and the long-range pattern. And they are predicting now to see twice as many named storms that we would normally see in, in a given season. So normally we would see a dozen named storms. Now they're predicting twice that many, 24 named storms this season. That may end up putting us into the Greek alphabet. Uh, by the end of the season, uh, hopefully it will wrap up sometime in October. But of course, you can get hurricanes into November, even into December, all year round, actually. Uh, they're predicting a dozen hurricanes. Normally, we would have six. And of major category three or greater, uh, a five of those so that is more than the average of three so we don't know if these are going to necessarily interact with land but we have to prepare just in case and you know we still have a lot of the season to go the peak isn't until september 10th so we really have a good three months left of hurricane season so it looks like we may have some very active times ahead so of course the season begins in june it ends november 30th and uh, the peak of the season is September 10th, so we still have about 90% of the season to go and uh, active days ahead. We had some activity across North Georgia today, but things are quieting down now. But some of these storms that moved through east side of Athens were pretty strong, and they came through Madison earlier bringing in some very gusty winds and then moved in across Clark Oconee County and now making their way up across Lake Hartwell. Those storms that were in Paulding County uh, and also on up into Polk County, those have since diminished and now we're seeing uh, quieter conditions out there tonight. So it's a little sticky out there. Dew points in the mid to upper 60s, that's humid air. And it's going to be getting more humid tomorrow as this boundary moves to the north. It's very saturated south of that boundary, so we'll end up seeing our humidity go up a bit. We did have that marginal risk. The Storm Prediction, is just, Prediction Center has just taken that out of our forecast for this evening. So I think we're back to seeing things on the quiet side now, at least for the rest of the evening. Uh, Georgia's Rome looking like this. We have a few clouds out there. Beautiful sunset underway at this time. Uh, sun was setting at 8:34 in Atlanta tonight. So we're looking at highs that were a little above average today. 91 was our high uh, during the day in Atlanta and then temperatures actually dropped when the rain moved through. We had a little under a tenth of an inch of the rain at Atlanta Hartsville Jackson Airport and that was enough to drop our temperatures down some 14 degrees. That happened in between 2 and 3 o'clock. That's when we had those storms rolling through uh, the connector and inside the perimeter and then things started to warm up right after that and currently we're in the mid 90s. So looking ahead, some afternoon pop ups. We're going to be staying hot with temperatures in the low to mid 90s as we head into the weekend across North Georgia and a summertime pattern ahead. That means heat of the day storms are expected. So as far as overnight tonight, things pretty quiet, although we could see a few morning showers here right around four to six o'clock in the morning. We were expecting maybe just some remnant showers moving in from southwest to northeast. And then during the day tomorrow, a 20 percent chance as we head into our afternoon hours. So between around two o'clock and uh, seven o'clock will likely be our most active time once again, just like it was today. So what we have left is moving off to the northeast. Things should quiet down for a few hours, maybe a few little leftover showers early tomorrow morning at daybreak and then we'll see the showers and storms reforming after lunch. This is right around 2.30. We could have a heavy downpour too like this future radar is showing here just uh, east of Canton possibly and then up in the North Georgia mountains again during the evening on our Thursday we could see 
see some of those heavier downpours. Some of these storms could have those gusty winds, the frequent lightning we've been seeing, and uh, be a little destructive as they move in in those very isolated areas. And then we're going to see that again on Friday after lunch. We'll see the same scenario and so on and so on as we head in through the weekend. So a 30% chance the next couple of days. Temperatures heating up more over the weekend. We should be in the low to mid 90s. We'll have a chance for showers and storms. I think Saturday will be the quietest of the weekend days. And a 30% chance Sunday, Monday, and a 40% chance for the middle of next week. And we are staying unseasonably warm. TikTok is at the center of different debates right now, from app security to oversight of foreign tech products. We've had our Verify team breaking down why this is happening. Here's Jason Puckett. TikTok, it's a video app owned by Beijing-based company ByteDance, where users make short videos on pretty much everything. Recent estimates show roughly 800 million users around the world. So what's the issue with TikTok? Put simply, TikTok is owned by a Chinese internet company, and officials in Washington, like Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, are worried the Chinese government can access the videos and personal data that Americans put on the app. He said users are, quote, putting private information in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, these concerns have led to the U.S. military banning the app and new bills in the House and Senate that would ban the app on all government phones. So what does TikTok say about all this? Well, they reject the concerns. A spokeswoman stated that TikTok stores its data in the United States and has, quote, strict controls on employee access to the information. Right now, we can't verify whether or not TikTok is actually sharing data with the Chinese government. ByteDance is a private company, and we can't see exactly how or where they send data. So can TikTok actually be banned in the U.S.? That is complicated. Right now, President Trump has given ByteDance till September 15th to sell TikTok to a U.S. company or be shut down, and Microsoft has already expressed interest. There is a legal precedent. Last year, a Chinese company was pressured to sell their ownership of dating app Grindr after, quote, concerns of foreign access to personally identifiable information of U.S. citizens. Now, that is a direct quote from this congressional research report talking about the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS. That's a long name. They're just an advisory group in the Treasury Department that looks into national security risks from foreign investments. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin has confirmed that the CFIUS is currently investigating TikTok. The countdown to the census just got shorter. See where Georgia stands with just two months left to make everyone count. It's the limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
in times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice? Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms is one of many Georgians who has not filled out their census, at least not yet, but the clock is ticking with the deadline now pushed to September 30th. I'm not ever prepared to record myself doing it, but given that the deadline has been pushed up, um, it is my intent to do it very soon. And you'll see, you'll know exactly the date that I fill it out because we'll post it online. The move to change the deadline was met with criticism yesterday from four former directors of the Census Bureau. According to the New York Times, they say pushing up the deadline could result in an incomplete count, and that would impact things like how congressional and local voting district lines are drawn, how $1.5 trillion in federal funds are then distributed. Right now, a little less than 59% of Georgians have filled out their census. Have you filled out yours, Jennifer? Have you done yours? I have. I have not done mine. I am delinquent as well. I'm with the mayor on this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's short of the national response rate and our state's response rate in 2010. Two unimaginable fights and two amazing victories of Forsyth County teenager celebrates regaining her strength after a devastating accident and helping to create a safer community. Iris related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. In a disinfect frequently spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. From a tribute to a teenager's triumph, she battled back for a near death after surviving a car crash one year ago. And John Shearick shows us what she's now doing to save others. 
Small steps becoming bigger steps. Zoe Ordway, nearly killed on August 12th last year as she was turning at a dangerous intersection near her home in Forsyth County, T-boned. Now Zoe Ordway, a rising senior at West Forsyth High School, is walking and celebrating near that intersection with her family and friends. The wreckage towed here for this moment. Everyone celebrating not just Zoe's difficult recovery. And I'm just really blessed to be here, and that's that's one of the main things that I when I drive by, I'm like, Holy crap, like I'm alive with that being what I was inside. Everyone is also celebrating another triumph for the past year, all through Zoe's painful physical therapy and surgeries. Zoe has been leading the fight for traffic lights along busy Post Road in Forsyth County. She and her friends have been moving heaven and earth and politicians and bureaucrats. And now a year later, they are celebrating the first set of traffic lights going up here. So it's really, really cool to see how you know, my accent has been able to help other people, hopefully, um, in the future. Zoe's father, Scott, showed me a video Zoe made of her favorite quotes from one of the Rocky movies about how life is not about how hard you get hit and hit again. It's about moving forward through it all. A surprise for Zoe, meeting for the first time. The man who ran to her rescue right after the wreck, Alex Figueroa, who held her hand that morning while the ambulance was on its way. He is here to thank Zoe, too, for working to save others along Post Road. Um, Next order really of business for Zoe, um, life. So I'm, I'm looking forward to making this my senior year be the best that it can. Small steps becoming bigger steps. Zoe Ordway, moving always forward. And an officer's duty to intervene when another officer uses unreasonable force. Right now on primetime, Atlanta's mayor announcing new plans to help reform the city's police department amid complaints of excessive force. Why she's getting pushback tonight. And new reports of Cherokee County students having to quarantine less than three days into the new school year. Why one parent still believes in-person learning is the right choice for her family. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. We're going to begin tonight with homeowners fighting back after property values plunged amid reports a nearby plant is releasing toxins into the air. Tracy A. McPeer has more on the class action lawsuit now being prepared against Theragenics. It's jarring because our home value is the biggest, you know, it's the biggest value we have in terms of any materiality, right? So that, that's huge. Andrew Kurt and his wife moved into the park at Vining subdivision in 2013. Then two months ago, they received a notice from the Cobb County Tax Assessor's Office that the tax assessed value of their home had dropped 10% due to an EPD identified environmental issue. And if you call them, they will respond indeed. It's because of the stereogenics plant. We did call the tax assessor's office and they said, in their opinion, yes, having a plant that uses ethylene oxide to sterilize medical equipment did devalue nearby homes. The EPA has said the toxin can cause cancer if you're exposed to it for long periods of time. And the Kurtz are not alone. The tax assessor's office tells us more than 5,000 homeowners received a similar letter with the same devaluation notice. It was sent to everyone living within a two-mile radius of the Sterogenics plant. Kurt says it's just another reason they want the plant closed down. We're still faced with a terrible hazard for explosiveness in the neighborhood, in this whole area, and that's not acceptable. So now Kurt and others have joined a class action lawsuit against Sterogenics, calling it their last hope at health and full value of their home. Absolutely recoup our value, that's obvious, but also to have Sterogenics closed down permanently. When we talked to the Cobb County Tax Assessor's Office, they said they've never dealt with an environmental issue like this before. They also say even if the plant were to close, the tax value of these homes wouldn't go back up right away. That would take a review of the home prices in the area, which happens every year in January. A spokesperson for Sterogenix tells us the tax assessor's office decision to reduce property tax values has no basis in fact. They add that Sterogenix has also agreed to enhance its facility and further reduce what they call already safe levels of ethylene oxide emissions at that facility. 
Today, Governor Kim signed a new law putting further regulations on companies that use ethylene oxide. It requires plants to report any spill or release of the toxic gas to the state within 24 hours. That information will then be posted publicly on the Environmental Protection Division's website. This comes after a series of leaks was uncovered. Covington's BD plant had large leaks in September 2019 and January 2016. In Cobb County, Sterigenics reported leaks in July 2019 in addition to two in 2018. Late this afternoon, Governor Brian Kemp signed a Police Protection Act into law. Now, the move was opposed by civil rights groups that say it tempers the state's newly signed hate crimes law. Well, Kemp issued this statement on the measure. He says this is House Bill uh, 838. He says it is a step forward as we work to protect those who are risking their lives to protect us. While some vilify, target, and attack our men and women in uniform for personal or political gain, this legislation is a clear reminder that Georgia is a state that unapologetically backs the blue. Meanwhile, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms has issued new executive orders today aimed at curbing the use of force violence uh, by the Atlanta City or by the Atlanta Police Department. So the orders are not effective just yet, but the mayor is already getting some pushback from police. 11 Alive's Doug Richards explains why. The effort to pull back on use of force guidelines is rooted in cases around the country. There's the George Floyd case in Minneapolis. There's the Richard Brooks case in southeast Atlanta. There's the case in May near Centennial Olympic Park when police chased after and used tasers on two college students in a car. Police were disciplined and charged with crimes in all of those cases. Mayor Bottoms released a list of use of force guidelines. They would allow officers to intervene when other officers use unreasonable force, curb retaliation against officers intervening develop techniques to de-escalate conflicts, revise evaluations of officers which would disincentivize certain arrests and incentivize alternatives, and create an online dashboard, posting ongoing use of force data and other police records. And I think this helps give the clarity that our officers have been asking for. But a police union president says, on the contrary, this will only make the use of force rules murkier. Well, then you're, the officers are just not going to engage. And then you're going to start seeing, again, where we would normally challenge people. We can't safely and confidently feel like we can do our job without losing our jobs and or getting arrested. Mayor Bottoms says new use of force rules are still weeks away, but she says they're necessary in communities where confidence in Atlanta police has eroded. The former Atlanta police officer charged with the murder in the shooting of Rayshard Brooks is suing to get his job back. Garrett Rolfe was fired from the police department after killing Brooks in the parking lot of a Wendy's in southeast Atlanta back in June. He was trying to arrest Brooks for DUI. Now his attorneys have filed a lawsuit claiming the city of Atlanta denied Rolfe due process before his termination. Meanwhile, Fulton County DA Paul Howard is asking the court to revoke Rolfe's bond. He's accused of going to Florida for a vacation without making the state aware of his travel plans. One of the people accused in the murder of a Clark Atlanta student could soon be released on bond. 21-year-old Alexis Crawford was killed last October. Jordan Jones was Crawford's roommate and close friend at the time. In January, a grand jury indicted Jones and her boyfriend on murder charges. Attorneys for Jones will argue for her to be released on bond. This is going to happen at a hearing tomorrow. 11 Alive's Joe Hankey has the response tonight from Crawford's family. The death of our beloved, beautiful, brilliant, and loving Alexis Janae Crawford has devastated every aspect of our lives. Reverend Markel Hudgens this afternoon read a statement from Alexis Crawford's family after learning Jordan Jones, who was previously denied bond, will have a hearing Thursday where a judge will reconsider bond. I cannot imagine a judge granting Jordan the freedom to walk around until her trial while Alexis will never get to walk around anywhere ever again. Investigators say Jones, who was Crawford's close friend and roommate, strangled and suffocated Crawford and then dumped her body in the wooded area of Exchange Park in Decatur. Jones's boyfriend, Baron Brantley, also charged in the attack and murder, in addition to being charged with sexually assaulting Crawford days earlier. 
A grand jury indicted the pair in January, and they pleaded not guilty in February, though detectives say they admitted to at least parts of the crime when questioned. And to now think that a judge could potentially grant a bond to Jordan Jones for killing Alexis Crawford is just unimaginable and poor salt into those wounds. A court filing shows the argument Jones's defense attorneys are expected to make. The filing reads, this defendant has no criminal history beyond a prior misdemeanor charge, has ties to the community, has no record or history of ever having threatened or intimidated anyone in her life, and has no indication that she is any type of flight risk. Upon the request of the Atlanta Police Department prior to the filing of any charges, the defendant returned to Atlanta from Detroit, Michigan, and voluntarily assisted them in their investigation. And Crawford's mother says two of her other children also attend college in Atlanta. If Jones is granted bond and leaves jail, she would consider pulling her two children out of school over safety concerns. Jones's hearing is scheduled for 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon in Fulton County Superior Court. We'll bring you any updates on the hearing on 11alive.com. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Again, you see my phone right here uh, on, the, on your screen because I'm talking to around 200 people on Facebook Live right now. A lot of folks are telling me uh, which areas that they got rain in their neighborhood. Other folks are saying they got no rain at all. And, you know, that's kind of what we have to get used to the next few days as we have these scattered showers that pop up where some people get rain, other people do not. Right now in Atlanta, we're looking good and no rain in our area, even though we had a few scattered showers and a couple of thunderstorms earlier on the south side of Atlanta. We had some flooding rain that came through uh, in a downpour there. Now the only thing we have is up in northeast Georgia. This is up around Lake Hartwell. If you're going up 85 here into Franklin County, this heavier rain is right on the Franklin and Hart County line and also the Hart and Elbert County line. That's where we have most of the thunder and lightning, which is approaching Hartwell. So I do think this is going to weaken a little bit, but up at Lake Hartwell, um, be prepared for some of that heavier rain that we're going to be seeing. We've got about 18 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes just in that small small little part here in Atlanta. We're dry looking good as we go through the rest of the nighttime hours with mainly dry conditions here. Take a live look out there. Let me show you what we're watching where this is our live camera up in Rome where we're looking toward the south and west where the sun set a little while ago. So of course it's getting a little darker and dry conditions up in North Georgia. Earlier we were reporting on a, a marginal risk for some stronger storms up in northeast Georgia, that level one out of five risk. Well, now the Storm Prediction Center has taken that risk level out. We're just talking about general showers that could pop up during the uh, late night hours, but I really think those rain chances are on the low end. Stay with us. We do have a chance that a few more showers are going to redevelop tomorrow in the afternoon and evening. We'll talk about those chances and whether or not that's going to linger into your weekend. Georgia has now passed the 200,000 mark for positive cases of COVID-19. Nearly 4,000 new cases reported today, but we're also seeing a jump in the number of new tests completed. Today, more than 30,000 were reported. That is a really significant increase. When you look at the number of new tests compared to new cases, you can see our weekly average rate of positive infections is dropping. Just what we want to see right tonight. We are learning about new cases of COVID-19 within the Cherokee County School District, plus a teacher now showing symptoms at Hasty Elementary Fine Arts Academy. A first grader tested positive. 10 students and a teacher must quarantine now for two weeks. An eighth grade student at Dean Rusk Middle School also tested positive. 15 students must quarantine for two weeks there. And an entire kindergarten class at RM Moore Elementary School has to quarantine for two weeks after a teacher showed symptoms and was in close contact with someone who tested positive for the virus. This comes one day after a second grade class at Sixes Middle Elementary School, that is, was informed that a student tested positive and would also have to learn virtually for 14 days. But with case numbers still high, parents across the state are facing some really tough decisions about whether to send their children to school in person. In that district, parents had a choice and the majority opted for in-person classes. Here's Elwin Lopez. The Cherokee County School District says 78% of families opted for in-person learning. Liz Trowbridge is one of those parents. She has an 11-year-old at Creekland Middle and a 16-year-old at Creekview High. Trowbridge says her high school told her just about half of her peers are wearing masks. She says she believes educators should let the students know why masks are recommended. 
On Monday, the district says a second grader who attended Sixes Elementary tested positive for the virus, adding that the child didn't start feeling sick until after the school day was over, and that's when the parents sought a COVID-19 test. Trowbridge says she is worried about what might happen next amid the pandemic, but believes the good, at least for her family, outweighs the bad. The caution is there, um, but this is the best thing for my kids is to go face to face instead of virtual learning. It's okay to make the choice that you feel is right for your family. We're all in this together and we want the best for our families. We also heard from one parent who says she doesn't believe that there's enough support for AP and honors classes through the virtual academy. And that's why she said she doesn't feel like she was left with much of a choice, but to send her child back into the classroom. And we have a back to school guide for you on 11alive.com that breaks down plans for each Metro Atlanta district. We can send it right to your phone if you like. Just text the word school to the number you see there on your screen 404-885-7600. Doctors want parents to know about a rare illness that's similar to polio. The CDC says it could affect children in larger numbers this winter. So we spoke with our medical correspondent, Dr. Sujatha Reddy, about it next. And don't forget, we're streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. More 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for 97. CDC has a warning tonight about a potential climb in the cases of a neurological condition with symptoms similar to polio and it's going to have serious health consequences for our children. So the cases peak every other year and although the illnesses are rare, um, 2018 saw the highest number of cases ever recorded at 238. We spoke with 11 Alive medical correspondent Dr. Sujatha Reddy about what parents need to know. The signs and symptoms to look for are gonna be things that look like an upper respiratory infection. Your child seems to have like a runny nose, that type of thing, possibly a fever. And while those are signs of coronavirus and the run of the mill cold, what you'll see more with acute flaccid myelitis is gonna be things affecting their nervous system. They may have trouble walking. They may say their arms and legs are tired or don't work right, they seem weak. You may notice that they're having trouble you know, speaking. They can also cause headache, backache, things like that. We don't want parents to be scared to bring their children to the doctor's office or an urgent care or an emergency room if they're showing signs of something that could be serious for the fear of coronavirus. The hospitals and doctor's offices are taking lots of precautions to protect us once we're in there. And there's some things that are gonna need to be evaluated by a healthcare professional. Dr. Reddy says the CDC wants people to know the signs and symptoms of this virus because the quicker the doctors find out about it, it's easier to treat. CDC officials say they do not know how the COVID-19 pandemic will impact any possible outbreak. 
I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers, and it's a lot quieter tonight than we've been dealing with over the past few nights. You know, last night we were all so excited about the um, International Space Station flying over. Tonight it's just a regular old night where we had a few showers earlier in some spots. Now uh, a lot of that has already faded out. We still have some showers that we're watching up in northeast Georgia, and I showed you this a minute ago. Let me take you up to Lake Hartwell, and these are the areas where we're seeing some of those showers. This is pretty much on the line there between Franklin County and Hart County. Also on the line between Hart County and Elbert County, the southern parts of Hartwell or Hart County, where we have some of that heavier rain and a lot of thunder and lightning that's moving over Lake Hartwell right now. We already have some light rain on the south end of the lake and still some of these showers will move in, but they, they are showing signs of weakening. Back here in Atlanta, we're looking fine. We still have a few of those lightning strikes, about 18 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes. And as you can see here in Atlanta, we're fine. And I think most of us are gonna stay dry as we go through the rest of the nighttime hours. Take a look at the bigger picture. I want to show you the interesting look at these temperatures today. We got up to 91 degrees for a high temperature this afternoon. Now I know you're only seeing 90 on this graphic, but we actually hit 91 in between those hourlies at one and two o'clock. Um, but then look what happened at four o'clock. The temperatures fell when some rain came in and rain cooled air really dropped that temperature down. But it was a fast moving system that, that just updated here. It was really at three o'clock. It went down to 77, then back up to 83 at four and then 89 at five o'clock. So this is what that rain can do for us. It'll briefly cool us down, but it can get hot. Once again, we got back up to 89 at five o'clock and then at 83 still uh, at this hour. So still very warm outside. Some spots though that had rain for a longer period stayed cool. Like look at Carrollton. 73 degrees. Peachtree City, you had some showers down there. It's 78 for you. Athens, some showers came by earlier. That's what we were watching moving up to Hartwell right now. So the temperature there dropped to 75. So uh, it's kind of interesting to look at the map and you can see those areas that picked up some rain because that dropped those temperatures. Now tonight, we will move from the 80s that we're in right now into the upper 70s, we think, by 11 o'clock. And then going down into the lower 70s by tomorrow morning, it's going to be a rather quiet start to the day in the morning, then 76 degrees at 9 o'clock tomorrow. So on the wasometer tomorrow, this is our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. We're going to go with a 7. We start off at 71, a mild start. We get up to 91 in the afternoon, and we'll see a mixture of sunshine and clouds and about a 30% chance for some of those scattered showers in the afternoon. It's not going to be widespread tonight. Uh, it's going to be clear. They're mainly dry in the morning. Dry conditions with some sunshine to start and then at lunchtime a couple of clouds build in and you know what happens in the afternoon here in the summertime. This is the pattern that we're in right now. We're going to see some of those scattered showers that'll be with us tomorrow. Rain chance at about 30% and, and again some of those showers that develop could have some heavy rain with them. I want you to be prepared for that. Friday morning a dry start in the afternoon Friday again about a 30% 20 to 30% chance for some scattered showers that'll develop here and I really think we'll have some slightly drier air moving in on Saturday to bring the rain chance down a little bit. It doesn't totally go away, but it does go down to 20% here for Saturday. So uh, Thursday and Friday, you see here those scattered showers that are going to be moving through the area uh, during the day and we'll continue to watch those showers that will stick with us. Those rain chances that will be at 30% uh, also on Friday and then down to a 20% chance on Saturday with a high of 93 and then Sunday, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday still talking about some of those rain chances. We'll, we'll go with a 30% chance Sunday and Monday, 40% Tuesday and Wednesday. So maybe a few additional showers for the end of the weekend and getting it in next week. But each day we're thinking temperatures are at least going to get into the lower 90s. At 81 years old, Prescott Lawrence has all the life experience anyone would ever need. Born in 1938, when the cost of an average house was just under $4,000 this weekend, he will fulfill his dream and receive his college degree, a dream that took more than a decade to achieve. 11 Alive's Brittany Klein Peters spoke with Lawrence about what it took to get to this moment. Age is a number. You're only as old as you feel, and I feel pretty young when I'm with the kids at school. 81-year-old Prescott Lawrence will graduate this weekend from Georgia Gwinnett College with a business degree and become the oldest student to ever graduate from the school. I've been taking two, maybe three courses a semester and the summer's off. Unlike his much younger classmates, he says he didn't seek a college education out of necessity. It was his desire to keep learning. You learn every day. Every day there's something new to learn. So why not concentrate on something 
He spent decades serving in the U.S. military. He worked several more jobs before deciding it was time to get his degree. Lawrence says he's had the support of his four children and 31 grandchildren. Lawrence suffered an aortic aneurysm, which took him out of classes for a while, but he came back determined, and now he's receiving a degree in business administration. The soon-to-be graduate has a message for those interested in going back to school. You learn every day. Every day there's something new to learn. Lawrence will graduate in a virtual ceremony on Saturday at 10 a.m. And as far as what's next for him, he tells me he's already working on his second degree, taking courses on the American Constitution and even Aristotle. Some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. The stalemate continues between Democrats and Republicans on the next coronavirus relief bill as the $600 extra unemployment benefit program now ends. Joining me right now is Ted Jenkin, CEO of Oxygen Financial. How serious now is the unemployment situation as we roll in to August? I mean, Jeff, it's very serious nationally. It's at 11.1 percent. We're a little bit thankful here in Georgia that it's only at 7.6 percent, but that's still pretty high. Let's remember this, since March 20th, there's been 53 million initial jobless claims in this country. And the big thing, Jeff, now is there's 18 million continuous claims. So there are many Americans that need this extra money every week. And if you consider this, more than 70% of Americans are in service-based jobs right now, Jeff. And the two R's, restaurant and retail, they have been hit really, really hard right now. In fact, Yelp had a survey that showed that 60% of the restaurants that said they were gonna temporarily shut down during the coronavirus are now going to be permanently closed. So the question is, Jeff, will there be the jobs for people to actually go back to work here? What are the proposals on the table right now? Are, are they significant? Are they helpful? Or where are we on that front? Huge stalemate right now, Jeff. Look, the average American, let's take Georgia as an example. People with the $600 were getting $965 a week. They're going to take a 65% pay cut, Jeff. How many people at work, if they got a 65% pay cut, would even go back to work? They're going to be down to $365 a week. So Congress passed an act 75 days ago, Jeff, called the HEROES Act. 
that would pay Americans is an additional $600 till January of 2021. So far, all the Senate has put together in the HEALS Act is a $200 a week extra stipend, and then something that would take you to about 70% of your overall wages. There was a proposal last week from Mitt Romney that started the unemployment at $500, and it would scale down to $300 by October. But it's a huge stalemate right now because one camp thinks people are eating Cheetos and playing video games and are at home, and, and the other camp really wants to have this money in people's hands and are worried about Americans being out on the street. Look, here's the concern, too. I mean, the government cannot be paying this indefinitely. I mean, that, that also will take a huge toll on this country economically. We have to get people back to work. Look, uh, I'm not in politics, but I would love to see an infrastructure bill go into place, both one that's traditional infrastructure and also digital infrastructure. Try to get Americans back to work because, simply put, many of these restaurant and retail jobs, I do not think, are going to return anytime soon. I, I think this reboot may have changed our habits uh, not only in our homes, but outside as well, as, as far as the amount of money that we spend in restaurants. Uh, no question about it, Jeff. The spending is way down, and as long as the coronavirus persists, things like entertainment, hospitality, travel, and leisure, they will all continue to suffer a real damage here. Ted Jenkins, as always, thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, Today, we're hearing from an Atlanta Dream player whose pregame wardrobe choice made some headlines. Last night, Elizabeth Williams, along with several teammates and players from other WNBA teams, wore a, quote, vote Warnock shirt. It was a carefully crafted message in support of U.S. Senate candidate Reverend Raphael Warnock and a strong shot across the bow at Senator Kelly Leffler, a co-owner of the Dream who is hoping to hold on to her seat in the Senate. 
Leffler has faced criticism from players for writing the WNBA commissioner opposing certain plans to honor the social justice movement. Today, Williams talked more about the player's decision to wear the shirts. It was something that we talked through. Um, again, we wanted to be strategic. We wanted to be intentional um, about our words and our language. And we wanted to make sure that whatever action was taken in doing so, all of the, the ideas that we've been focused on weren't lost. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that this was completely player led and it was completely optional. The senator responded saying, quote, this is just more proof that the out of control cancel culture wants to shut out anyone who disagrees with them. It's clear that the league is more concerned with playing politics than basketball. And I stand by what I wrote in June. Williams says she and the other league players will wear the shirts again and continue to talk about social justice issues. And we've got dry weather here in Atlanta. It's going to be a quiet night. And, you know, we were showing you the, those showers and storms. Look at this. I picked up my phone instead of my clicker. Sorry about that. This is the right one. Uh, I was telling you about those showers that are up in northeast Georgia that had some heavy rain and thunder and lightning with them up 85 closer to Lake Hartwell. I want you to watch how these are just falling apart. This is what I'm talking about. A lot of times when these storms develop, they move a little bit and then they rain themselves out. That's what's happening this, with this right now. If we see it kind of splitting up a little bit, we have one area of heavier rain that's turning more moderate now right there on the Hart and Franklin County line right at 85 and then another one right here. This is the one that had all the lightning in the southern parts of Hart County and on the Elbert County line near Lake Hartwell. That's falling apart too. So we don't have any more lightning with this and the rain is really falling apart. There's just going to be a few light showers there over uh, Lake Hartwell and then elsewhere around North Georgia. We're quiet. We do have some showers uh, down to the south and east of us south of Augusta and east of Macon. There's a storm down there that has a severe thunderstorm with it. That's not anywhere near us and we don't have to worry about that one. Let me show you what we're watching outside right now. And this is a picture that was sent in by Kristen, one of our 11 Alive community storm trackers in South Atlanta. It's a great example of what we talk about here when we say some of these isolated storms could dump a lot of rain on one neighborhood and not anything on another neighborhood. Well, in this neighborhood, they got so much rain, it started to cause some flooding there because so much rain fell in a short period of time and it was overwhelming the drainage system and we had some flooding that has now receded and everything's fine now as we are drying out. But that's just a perfect example of how, you know, like we didn't get that much rain here in Atlanta, but just a little ways down the road on the south side, that's how much they got. Stay with us. We're going to continue in this pattern with some scattered showers each and every afternoon, but the rain chances will change a little bit from day to day. We'll break it all down for you coming up. All right, Chris, we'll see you in a couple of minutes, sir. At least six people are confirmed dead and millions are without power after Tropical Storm East Aeas cut a path of destruction from the Carolinas to Canada. Cleanup is underway right now after the storm knocked down trees and power lines, broke out windows, and caused widespread flooding across several states. NBC's Chris Pallone has the latest. Isaias may be gone, but it will be quite a while before it is forgotten. The tropical storm left a path of destruction which caused widespread flooding in Pennsylvania. Got the mud. There's mud everywhere. And it's just, it's just nasty. And brought down trees and power lines up and down the eastern seaboard. Crack, crack, crack. And went, what ooze? Straight through their house. I was completely scared. Isaias is being blamed for several deaths, including one in New York City, where a tree fell on a parked car and killed the driver sitting inside. A tornado right outside my window. The storm even spawned several tornadoes. It was crazy. See it forming right in front of you. It's like, what? At its height, Isaias knocked out power to millions. The outage, the second worst ever in the history of the power company, which serves New York City. The state's governor has launched an investigation into several utility companies, accusing them of being unprepared for the storm. A similar situation unfolding in Connecticut, where it could be days before all the power is back on. We're going to do everything we can to get power up as soon as we can. Isaias is now deep into northern Canada. The cleanup in the U.S. now underway. How is it that nearly 3,000 tons of ammonium nitrate was unsafely stored in a warehouse? This question remains after the blast in Lebanon yesterday, killing more than 100 people. The government ordered the house arrest of port officials in charge of storage and security pending a formal investigation. Customs officials said they warned about the dangers after their inspection six months ago. 
UN agencies met today to talk about relief efforts for Lebanon. One of yesterday's blasts destroyed the country's major grain silos, leaving Lebanon with less than a month's reserve of grain. It's an economic crisis, a financial crisis, a political crisis, a health crisis, and now this horrible explosion. So there are many layers to what's happening in Lebanon that is constantly testing the ability of the Lebanese and the refugees who live in Lebanon to be resilient. And we'll continue to follow this story for you on 11alive.com. NASA's commercial crew program is off to a great start. Astronauts Bob Bacon and Doug Hurley, who completed the first commercial space flight, spent 64 days in orbit in the Dragon Space Capsule before landing in the Gulf of Mexico. It may take a few weeks for NASA and SpaceX to label the mission a success, but NASA is already planning future flights with SpaceX to one day return to the moon and potentially Mars. Now we've got commercial crew to the International Space Station, and eventually we're going to have a whole fleet of commercial space stations. Among those next to ride in the Dragon Space Capsule is Bankin's wife and astronaut Megan MacArthur. All right, back here on planet Earth, as the school year starts, a number of families are overwhelmed when it comes to virtual learning. So the Boys and Girls Club is hoping to help out those parents by reopening its doors to allow students to learn virtually. As Nick Sturdivant reports, many of the staff are not teachers, but they are determined to help those parents out. You know, for a majority of students, they have to learn virtually because of this pandemic. So for the Boys and Girls Club, what options are you guys providing to help parents and families? Beginning on August 17th, we're going to be opening up some of our clubs again. Um, we have been working with our families over the last few months during this closure and staying connected with them. And we're hoping to especially be there for families um, who may not have a place for their kid um, during this distance learning phase. David Jernigan is the president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club in Metro Atlanta, overseeing 20 clubs over several counties. The Boys and Girls Club in Metro Atlanta helps about 2,500 children across the area in underserved communities. With this new plan to help, he says clubs will operate at 25% capacity. We'll probably be in the six to 700 range um, of kids coming through our doors. We'll have a lot of measures in place to protect them. Our kids and staff will be wearing um, a mask, and of course, we'll have all the, the cleanings and those sorts of procedures in place. We'll keep kids in small pods throughout the day with an eight to one staff to kid ratio, um, and those eight kids will travel together um, so we don't have a lot of mixing. That's 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, that's a full day. <laughs> That's, yeah. a, that's a big, big responsibility. I mean, I, I will say when we went out to our staff and we started engaging with them and asking about reopening, they were the ones that challenged us as leaders. And this is not our traditional model. Our program during the day will be largely supporting kids in their virtual instruction. Um, and then, as I said, wrapping around other programs and activities. If they are in a district where the school doors have, have physically opened, our services will be focused on serving kids as an after school uh, service. Jernigan says staff will be trained on safety protocols and supporting virtual learners. And I will say that the districts around us have really stepped up and they're offering to do a number of things to support us, everything from sending in, you know, IT support to help us figure out how we support the kids. Um, to even potentially sending in instructional support. So the plan is to serve the members first, and those are members of the Boys and Girls Club, but this comes with a huge price tag here, folks. So to keep the doors open eight hours a day, it could cost several hundred thousand dollars, more compared to previous years. The Georgia Department of Corrections responding to a video obtained by 11 Alive from inside Ware State Prison, where several inmates and staff were injured over the weekend. What they had to say about accusations of inhumane conditions. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, 
live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Tonight, the Georgia Department of Corrections is responding to accusations of poor conditions inside Ware State Prison. After exclusive video we shared with you last night on Uplate, it appears to show inmates with no running water, little food, and begging for power. So this comes just days after a violent attack inside the prison that left two guards and three inmates with injuries. 11 Alive's Hope Ford received the exclusive video showing the conditions inside, and we want to warn you. Some may find that video very disturbing. It was Tuesday, August 4th. Time is 1-12, as they say on the clock out there. Cell phone video apparently from inside it's Ware State Prison, an inmate describing the current conditions. They have cut the power off. They have cut everything off. The video shows the toilet not flushing, no water from the sink. There's no water coming up. He claims inmates haven't had a shower in a week and very little food. We had one scoop of ice. Uh, thing. And if we might get that reason we ride, reason why the ride pop, because of health issues. In a second video, you hear several inmates scream for electricity. No response. We have got no response. We have to be no doors. Keep asking for power. The new video and allegations comes after the prison went into lockdown because of a violent attack on Saturday. You can see two men on the floor with bloody clothing. We need some. Help, man. A mother of a different inmate currently inside the prison says her son called her in a panic. He was like, Mama, I love you. They go around scattering people, they breaking books. The mother wanted to remain anonymous and says she hasn't heard from her son or the Department of Corrections since Saturday's lockdown. Fearful because you don't know if your child is going to make it. The mother wants the department to do something to help staff and improve conditions inside the prison. And that puts the workers in danger so the Georgia Department of Corrections has since pushed back on some of those claims made by the inmates and the family members. Uh, the agency says the facility did not lose power at any point and inmates are being provided meals every single day. Now during the lockdown they are being escorted to and from the showers according to the agency. And as for those working toilets not working properly, they say maintenance staff is now checking each and every cell. 
and additional staff has been assigned to the prison to help with day-to-day -day operations. Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms is one of many Georgians who has not filled out their census, at least not yet, but the clock is ticking with the deadline now pushed until September 30th. I'm not ever prepared to record myself doing it, but given that the deadline has been pushed up, um, it is my intent to do it very soon. And you'll see, you'll know exactly the date that I fill it out because we'll post it online. The move to change the deadline was met with criticism yesterday from four former directors of the Census Bureau. According to the New York Times, they say pushing up the deadline could result in an incomplete count. That would affect things like how congressional and local voting district lines are drawn and how $1.5 trillion in federal funds are distributed. Right now, a little less than 59% of Georgians have filled out their census. That is short of the national response rate, and our state's response rate is in 2010. Isaias is gone. It moved up into Canada uh, late last night, and it was downgraded to a, uh, a post-tropical system last night. And then this morning at 5 o'clock, the National Hurricane Center issued the last advisory on that system. So we're no longer dealing with Isaias. And it's pretty quiet elsewhere in the tropics. We are watching a little system out to the east of us right there that you see highlighted in yellow but it doesn't really have much of a future with it. In fact, the Hurricane Center is thinking this only has about a 10% chance of developing over the next uh, two or five days. So we really think that's just gonna be absorbed here and just fall apart. And then elsewhere, nothing else is really brewing right now, but this is the time of year when things start to start developing any, uh, a lot faster. We get into the peak of our hurricane season on September 10th. So usually in August, things start ramping up a little bit more. We see more activity out there. We have already had a lot of activity. We have had nine named storms so far this year. Josephine would be the next name. And Colorado State University has upped their, uh, their predictions for this year. They always give a, you know, a mid-season update. And they've actually, earlier they thought we were going to have 20 storms this season, 20 named storms. They've now upped that to 24. They're now thinking that 12 of those will be hurricanes. And of those, they think five of them will be major hurricanes. So as you can see, that's way above the average. These are the average numbers right here. And, you know, as I mentioned, we've already had nine named storms. So so we're expecting a lot more as we get into the rest of August and also into September, October. The season doesn't end until the end of November. Back here at home, we've been dealing with a lot of humidity around and some of those scattered showers that pop up with the heat. And we're going to keep that with uh, dew points that are going to be in the upper 60s the next couple of days. I've been telling you about our rain chance coming down a little bit on Saturday. That's because some slightly drier air is going to move in. We're going to see the dew point. That should feel pretty comfortable on Saturday, even though it's going to be hot in the you know, low to mid 90s in some spots. And then the humidity levels and the dew points start coming back up as we go into next week. And that's when we're going to see our rain chances that are going to be going back up as well. Our high today was 91. Our low this morning, 74. That was below above average this morning and also this afternoon. We should be around 89 and 71 at Hartsfield Jackson. We picked up almost a tenth of an inch of rain. That's that quick moving shower that came through earlier that dropped the temperatures into the 70s for a brief period before it warmed back up. And we still have a surplus roughly around 10 and a half inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. So as we go through the next few days, we're still going to be dealing with those afternoon pop up showers. Temperatures are still going to be hot with highs getting into the lower 90s here, and this is really just going to be that typical summertime pattern where we start off dry. It gets hot in the afternoon with the humidity around. We'll see a few of those showers that will bubble up here and there. So here's what we're watching uh, overnight tonight. We're going to fall from the 80s into the 70s for the overnight hours and then early in the morning we will be in those lower 70s. It's going to be a mild start and then during the afternoon hot again up to 91 a 7 on the wisometer and that 30% chance for some scattered showers that'll be popping up and we're going to keep that 30% also on Friday. I do think the rain chances come down to 20 percent on Saturday back to 30 percent Sunday and Monday and then Tuesday and Wednesday maybe even some higher chances remember on that graphic I was showing you how the moisture level in the air the content moisture content was going to be increasing and that'll help those rain chances go up a little bit more uh, for part of the beginning and middle of next week with high temperatures still holding in the lower 90s. Hiring in the U.S. decreased last month according to payroll companies ADP private companies only added 
167,000 workers to their payroll. This is a sharp fall from the nearly 4 million jobs created in June. Companies hope this could add urgency to talks over another round of federal COVID aid. Walmart delays the launch of Walmart Plus again. The subscription service will offer same day grocery delivery and other items, discounted fuel at Walmart gas stations and early deals access. Walmart was set to launch the service in March or April, push it to July and now it's delayed again. The company has not revealed if it has a new launch date or if Walmart Plus will begin regionally or even nationwide. The service is set to cost $98 a year. You can soon grocery shop while catching a movie. Walmart lifts the curtain on the launch of its pop up drive in movie theaters. The company partners with the Tribeca Film Festival to provide a free family friendly entertainment option during the pandemic. The first movie in Georgia will play October 16th at the Loganville Walmart. Stick around. We'll be right back. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. We're going to continue with this summertime pattern with high temperatures each day in the lower 90s and uh, those rain chances that will just be popping up in the afternoon and you can see that the percentages of rain are going to just kind of change subtly. We'll say 30% chance Thursday and Friday. Drier air on Saturday. I'm not taking the rain chance totally away, but going, I'm going down to 20% back to 30% Sunday and Monday and then even higher chances Tuesday and Wednesday back up to 40%. So it's that type of rain that just kind of pops up, rains itself out and then it's steam. All right, stick around. Prime time rose on at 10, and we'll see you on Up Late at 11 on 11 Alive. In doing their part to make a difference, we see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. 
quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1101 Live News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Tonight at 10, more students in one Metro Atlanta school district forced to quarantine after another positive COVID-19 case. How the district is handling growing concerns. And Governor Kemp signs a bill protecting police and first responders. Why the measure is getting backlash. Plus how the Georgia Department of Corrections is responding to claims of poor conditions at one of their state prisons. If you haven't seen this video, get ready. First tonight, COVID-19 concerns in Cherokee County. Tonight, more students have tested positive for the virus since the first day of classes on Monday. Chanu Hur is live at one of those schools, Dean Rusk Middle School in Canton. Chanu, all yours. Yeah, guys, the principal here sent home a letter saying an eighth grader at this school tested positive for COVID-19. So that means any students and staff who have been in close contact with this student is also now required to quarantine for 14 days. Now, at least two other schools also sent letters home to families. As of tonight, there are at least three positive cases in the district. There's the eighth grader from Dean Rusk Middle School. Last night, we told you about a second grader at Sixes Elementary who tested positive. There's also a first grader from Hasty Elementary School's Fine Arts Academy. And the Cherokee County School District says an entire kindergarten class at RM Moore Elementary is in quarantine after a teacher showed symptoms. The district says the teacher who had contact with the family member who also tested positive. Now, we've been told that teacher has been tested, but the results have not come in yet. In a letter to stakeholders on Monday, the superintendent says the district takes these positive cases seriously and will shut down schools if cases rise and it's in the best interest of the community. 
All right, this is not going to be a fun school year. Thank you. We'll keep you updated on that story and other districts. You can check it out on 11alive.com for all the very latest information on schools and if your child is safe, where he or she may be going. New tonight, civil rights groups are calling it a controversial move from Governor Kemp. He signed a measure into law that protects police and other first responders from biased, motivated crimes in our state. Hope Ford has the details for us. For a month, protesters voiced opposition to House Bill 838. How do we want justice? Mainly saying the bill is unnecessary. We don't want anyone dying. We don't want people dying. There are already protections in place for police officers. So what is the purpose of this? Hannah gebrson Lossi and Keith Strickland were two of the voices behind a movement asking Kemp to veto the bill, which makes crimes against an officer punishable by at least a year in prison, as well as a potential $5,000 fine. We're fighting to see a better community. We're fighting to see safer neighborhoods. And he continues to fuel this tension and this system of oppression with bills like HB 838. The law was passed in July alongside the state's historic hate crimes bill. The Georgia NAACP dubbed HB 838 the police hate crimes bill, since it also allows officers to sue people if their civil rights are violated. So now if we say that something was an act of hate, or we say that this should be looked into more thoroughly, if it has a negative repercussion, now you can sue us. Kemp said in a statement he attended the funerals of far too many law enforcement officers who were killed in the line of duty and we must act. Deborah Salasi and Strickland say they agree, but wanted police reform to be the main focus of the governor. We don't want to see a police officer hurt, and no way is that what we stand for. What we're saying is that we want to live in a world where nobody has to be in fear. The police protections bill comes as Mayor Keisha <laughs> Lance Bottoms issued new executive orders aimed at curbing use of force by Atlanta police. The orders are not effective yet, but the mayor is already getting some blowback from police. Mayor Bottoms released a list of proposed guidelines. They would allow officers to intervene when other officers use unreasonable force, curb retaliation against officers intervening, develop techniques to de-escalate conflicts, revise evaluations of officers which would disincentivize certain arrests and incentivize alternatives. Also create an online dashboard with ongoing use of force data and other police records. Mayor Bottom says new rules are still weeks away, but she says they're necessary for many communities who distrust the police. The widow of Rayshard Brooks, again calling for justice, she wants to know why the fired Atlanta police officer who is accused of murdering her husband off University Avenue at that Wendy's in June took a trip to Daytona Beach, a vacation while out on bond. And as for that former officer, he is now going after the city for firing him. John Sherrick on the case for us tonight. The widow of Rayshard Brooks, Tamika Miller, incredulous, finding out that the now fired Atlanta police officer accused of murdering Brooks, Garrett Rolfe, who is free on bond, left Atlanta on Saturday, according to prosecutors, drove more than 400 miles to Daytona Beach, his ankle monitor placing him in a residential neighborhood there. It let me know that Officer Ralph did not care about what the judge had laid down. The DA is asking a judge to revoke Rolf's bond, put him back in jail. No comment yet from Rolf's attorneys. And now Rolf is on the attack, suing Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms for firing him without due process the day after Brooks was killed. I do not believe that this was a justified use of deadly force. Atlanta attorney Randall Kessler, who is not involved in the case, says Rolf's lawsuit and the similar lawsuits from two other fired officers accused of using excessive force will test the mayor's powers to fire officers without holding hearings first. Uh, the mayor does have the right to, to fire them, but did she do it in the right way? Um, was it a wrongful firing? You know, that's the problem when you don't measure twice and cut once. You make a judgment and you act, there's gonna be backlash like this, and I think this lawsuit's not gonna end uh, quickly. The mayor's office did not respond to our request for comment about firing officers with no hearings. The dispute will play out in the courts. A roommate charged with murdering a Clark Atlanta student is asking to be let out on bond. 21-year-old Alexis Crawford reported missing last fall. Her body was later found in some woods in Decatur. A grand jury indicted Crawford's roommate. Jordan Jones and Jones boyfriend Baron Brantley on murder charges earlier this year. You know all about this case. Jones was previously denied bond, but has been granted a hearing tomorrow to have her bond reconsidered. 
As you can imagine, Crawford's family, they don't like this idea at all. They strongly oppose any concept, any idea, any thought that she would get out of jail before a trial. While there's nothing that will bring my daughter back, jail without bail for the murderers would give me and my family some peace and security while we await justice to be served. Jones and Brantley have pleaded not guilty, but detectives testified the pair admitted to parts of the crime when questioned. Jones's bond hearing is scheduled for 1 p.m. Thursday in Fulton County Courts. Tonight, the Georgia Department of Corrections responding to accusations of poor, awful, horrible conditions inside Ware State Prison. We shared this exclusive video with you last night, appearing to show inmates without running water, very little food, and they were begging for power. This comes after a violent attack inside the Waycross Prison, about four and a half to five hours away from where we are right now in Midtown. It left two staff members and three inmates with injuries. Now, the Georgia Department of Corrections pushed back on some of these claims made by inmates and family. The agency says this facility did not lose power at any point. Inmates are given meals daily, and during lockdown, they are being escorted to and from the showers. As for the toilets not working, they say maintenance staff, they're checking out each cell. And additional staff has been assigned to the prison to help the day-to-day -day operations. Tomorrow, former prison guards and family members of current and former inmates at Ware State Prison, they're going to hold a protest outside of the parole board in downtown Atlanta. It has been scheduled and slated for 1 o'clock. We'll be covering that for you tomorrow. A Georgia representative is joining efforts to help find a missing man with dementia. Atlanta police is asking for help finding 67 year old Lazarus Parker. He was last seen Friday morning around 11 near Glenview Circle in Valley Ridge Drive. Today, his family passed out flyers in the Mechanicsville area, hoping someone may have some information. Representative Hank Johnson is a friend of Parker's and is pleading for help. He says Parker's dementia has gotten so bad he had to leave his job at MARTA and doesn't recognize his son. There is a $1,000 reward in this case. A man was taken into custody after an hours long standoff with police in Henry County last night. We first told you this breaking news at 11 on 11 Alive. Police say a man involved in a domestic incident locked himself inside his home on East Atlanta Road with a child inside. Police say they were eventually able to convince him to come out and no one was hurt. Still ahead tonight, they survived COVID-19. Now, former patients can help others recover. A passionate plea from families who've experienced the devastating effects of the virus personally. We had a few showers in our area earlier today. They're all fading out right now. Stay with us. We'll talk about the chances that we'll see more of those summertime pop-ups redeveloping. And be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect. COVID-19 continues to put a serious strain on Georgia's health care resources. 
with just over 3,000 patients in the hospital today. But there are some signs that we are seeing a bit of a plateau right now. Look at the orange line you see there. That is the number of people currently needing serious medical treatment for the virus right now. We saw a dramatic increase in late June and early July, but that number, at least for now, seems to be stabilized. There is a way doctors are seeing a lot of success in helping those COVID patients recover. They are using convalescent plasma, that's full of antibodies from donors who already have survived the virus. The American Red Cross says they've already helped 1,400 people here in our state. But the need for donors is still desperate. Savannah Levin shows us how plasma can change the course of coronavirus from the families who've seen it up close. The night that I took my father into the hospital, he was very incoherent. I've never seen him like that. Brian Walter will never forget that drive to the ER. He didn't know then it would be the last time he'd see his dad in person the final moments they'd spend together. He finally said to me at one point, he said, I'm, I'm sorry, Brian, but it's very hard for me to talk right now. I, I don't have the energy. COVID was about to take John Walter's life, but a dose of donor plasma gave him enough energy to say goodbye. We got a, a video chat from my dad. He was so alert and awake and understanding, and he can, continued like that for probably about three or four days. After his father's passing and recovering from the virus himself, Brian donated his plasma. I believe the whole process was two hours long and your two hours could give another family a few days of ultimately saving someone's life or giving more time to say goodbye, which was in what, what happened in our case. Other survivors are doing the same. I know how scary it was being sick. It's really simple and it's painless um, and it can really help help save a life. You can turn a negative experience into a positive one. I'll continue to donate because I know that it's the right thing to do and there's no reason not to. No side effects. There's no problems with it. Uh, it's just a simple way to save somebody else's life. The Red Cross says there are not enough COVID-19 plasma donations to go around. You have to just walk in somebody else's shoes. Imagine you on a ventilator, you saying, you know, goodbye to your family via FaceTime, not even be able to hold them, and just knowing that if somebody, somebody donated their antibodies, their plasma, it could possibly save your life. For those who are lucky enough to survive, a call to action, and for one more act of bravery. That's America strong. You can't do anything more American, uh, more moral than to save a life, right? The scattered showers across Metro Atlanta could continue this week. Well, it is August. We would expect that, Chris. Uh, a lot of heat, a lot of humidity. And so it goes here in the South. And, and those are the ingredients needed to help some of these showers bubble up. That's what we experienced today. Not everybody got hit, but the folks who got rain got a lot of it with some of those scattered showers that rolled through earlier. Now it's a lot quieter. You've got some false echoes on the south side. The green you're seeing down there, that's not rain. The last rain that we've been watching has been north and east of the city, where we had a lot of heavy rain, thunder and lightning up near Lake Hartwell. As it moved over Lake Hartwell, though, it has been falling apart. We had thunder and lightning on the Hart and Elbert County line. Also there on the Franklin County line of Hart County, where we had some of those heavier showers. But now it's all fallen apart and has pushed up into the Carolinas. And then we do have some showers uh, south and east of us, well out of our viewing area. And then a couple of little spotty showers over in Alabama. We don't think those are going to be impacting us here tonight. So expect a quiet night tonight. And then tomorrow afternoon, with those ingredients again, the heat and humidity, we're going to see a few scattered showers that are going to be redeveloping once again for us. But the rain chance is only at 30%. Take a look at what we're watching right now. This is a look at these temperatures today. Now, it was really interesting this afternoon because, you know, it got hot. Temperatures got up to 91 degrees for our high temperature uh, in between 1 and 2 o'clock. And then the rain came in, and that caused the temperatures to drop. It actually dropped into the 70s here uh, when that rain came in. And it was a quick moving system. We only got a little bit less than a tenth of an inch of rain at Hartsfield. And then it warmed right back up after that rain moved out. It got kind of hot and steamy there, 89 at 5 o'clock. 
now we're still holding in the 80s uh, as we go into the late night hours. Now there were some spots though that got some rain and it stayed a little bit longer and it cooled the temperatures down and it has stayed cold. Look at look at Carrollton. You had some showers in West Georgia a little bit earlier. It's 72 degrees in Carrollton right now compared to 82 that we have in Atlanta. 76 in Peachtree City, 75 in LaGrange, a few more 70s over parts of North Georgia, even 60s right now up in the mountains in Blairsville. That would feel really nice, wouldn't it? But here in town, it's mild. We'll be mild in the morning. We'll get down to around 72 degrees in the uh, lower 70s in the early morning hours tomorrow. Most places are going to be dry. And then through the morning hours, it's going to be a dry start. It's just going to be in the afternoon when we see those scattered showers redeveloping thanks to that heat and humidity. How much heat are we going to have? How about that? 91 degrees for a high. That's where we were today. We hit 91. I think we'll do it again tomorrow. 30% chance for showers on our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. We're going to go with a 10. Here you can see tonight how things are a lot quieter. In the morning, it is going to be dry to start. A few clouds up in North Georgia, more sunshine from Atlanta southward. And then at noon tomorrow, a few more clouds around. And then here you see in the afternoon, it's really similar to what we had today, where not everybody's getting rain at the same time. It's not like a cold front coming through or we can time out a line of showers moving in. It's just the scattered showers that will bubble up with the heat and humidity and the rain chance tomorrow at about 30% and then they will die out in the evening and then on Friday we're going to do the same thing all over again and we're really going to be with this pattern until the weekend when it's not going to be totally dry on Saturday but the dew points are going to lower meaning that the moisture content in the air is going to be a little bit lower Saturday and I'm going with slightly lower rain chances on Saturday. It's amazing what we get excited about it. We're going from the 30% chance Thursday and Friday down to a 20% chance on Saturday with that slightly drier air in place. I don't think it's going to be as muggy Saturday either. Uh, and then Sunday, we've got a 30% chance for showers again into Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday next week higher moisture content in the air, we will see higher rain chances at about 40% with highs still in the lower 90s. Take a look at your weather wow moment for the day. This is Roseanne Buscarella Keenan uh, from Marietta, one of our 11 Alive community storm trackers. Beautiful pictures of the clouds and some crepuscular rays that were coming through there as the sun kind of hits something or another cloud on uh, and it causes a shadow across the sky. Uh, looking pretty cool there with those shadows uh, over the sky thanks to that sun low on the horizon. We would love to see your weather well moment and we normally get these from our 11 Live Community Storm Trackers. You can be a part of that group on Facebook. Just search 11 Live Storm Trackers. Ask to become a member. We'll let you in and you can also share your weather information, pictures and videos. Next, this 81 year old grad is proving it's never too late to achieve your goals. Why he never stopped working to get the chance to walk across that stage. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. 
the things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This At 81 years old, Prescott Lawrence has all the life experience anyone would ever need. Born in 1938, when the cost of an average house, Jeff, was just under $4,000. Yeah, and FDR was running around in Warm Springs, Georgia. He was a cut in the deal for a Ford in downtown Atlanta, believe it or not. That Ford is currently displayed in Warm Springs. So 1938 and that whole period through there is an eventful year. This weekend, this man will fulfill his dream and receive his college degree. It's a dream that took more than a decade to achieve. 11 Alive's Brittany Kleinpeter spoke with Mr. Lawrence about what it took to get this moment done. Age is a number. You're only as old as you feel, and I feel pretty young when I'm with the kids at school. 81-year-old Prescott Lawrence will graduate this weekend from Georgia Gwinnett College with a business degree and become the oldest student to ever graduate from the school. I've been taking two, maybe three courses a semester and the summer's off. Unlike his much younger classmates, he says he didn't seek a college education out of necessity. It was his desire to keep learning. You learn every day. Every day there's something new to learn. So why not concentrate on something he spent decades serving in the U.S. military. He worked several more jobs before deciding it was time to get his degree. Lawrence says he's had the support of his four children and 31 grandchildren. Lawrence suffered an aortic aneurysm, which took him out of classes for a while, but he came back determined, and now he's receiving a degree in business administration. See that? The soon-to-be graduate has a message for those interested in going back to school. Never too late. You learn every day. Every day there's something new to learn. Lawrence will graduate in a virtual ceremony on Saturday at 10 a.m. And as far as what's next for him, he tells me he's already working on his second degree, taking courses on the American Constitution and even Aristotle. Never stop learning. All right, Jeff, time for me to head out to get ready for Up Late coming up in about 35 minutes over on 11 Alive. All right, I should see you then. Here's what's coming up on the big 36. The president had more to say about celebrations honoring the late Congressman John Lewis. And his comments, as you might guess, are drawing some criticism. That's straight ahead. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. 
We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. As the school year starts, a number of families are overwhelmed when it comes to virtual learning. The Boys and Girls Club hoping to help by reopening its doors to allow students to come in and learn virtually. As Nick Sturdivant reports, this is a pivot for the Boys and Girls Club. Many of the staff are not teachers, but they are determined to help parents. You know, for a majority of students, they have to learn virtually because of this pandemic. So for the Boys and Girls Club, what options are you guys providing to help parents and families? Beginning on August 17th, we're gonna be opening up some of our clubs again. Um, we have been working with our families over the last few months during this closure and staying connected with them. And we're hoping to especially be there for families um, who may not have a place for their kid um, during this distance learning phase. David Jernigan is the president and CEO of the Boys and Girls Club in Metro Atlanta, overseeing 20 clubs over several counties. The Boys and Girls Club in Metro Atlanta helps about 2,500 children across the area in underserved communities. With this new plan to help, he says clubs will operate at 25% capacity. We'll probably be in the six to 700 range um, of kids coming through our doors. We'll have a lot of measures in place to protect them. Our kids and staff will be wearing um, a mask, and of course, we'll have all the, the cleanings and those sorts of procedures in place. We'll keep kids in small pods throughout the day with an eight to one staff to kid ratio, um, and those eight kids will travel together um, so we don't have a lot of mixing. That's 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, that's a full day. <laughs> That's, yeah. a, that's a big, big responsibility. I mean, I, I will say when we went out to our staff and we started engaging with them and asking about reopening, they were the ones that challenged us as leaders. And this is not our traditional model. Our program during the day will be largely supporting kids in their virtual instruction. Um, and then, as I said, wrapping around other programs and activities. If they are in a district where the school doors have, have physically opened, our services will be focused on serving kids as an after school uh, service. Jernigan says staff will be trained on safety protocols and supporting virtual learners. And I will say that the districts around us have really stepped up and they're offering to do a number of things to support us, everything from sending in, you know, IT support to help us figure out how we support the kids. Um, to even potentially sending in instructional support. The plan is to serve members first, then to branch out. This comes with a big price tag, though. They don't usually keep doors open eight hours a day. It's costing them several hundred thousand dollars more compared to previous years. Joe Biden will not receive the Democratic nomination for president in person. Party officials say uh, the presumptive nominee will not travel to Milwaukee to accept the Democratic bid due to coronavirus concerns. Mr. Biden will now accept virtually from his home state of Delaware and all other speakers, including the vice presidential nominee, will address the convention remotely as well. This convention scheduled to run very soon from August 17th through August 20th. These are crazy times in which we live. Could you have imagined a time in our lives when we would hear such a story or I would be reading such a story? Incredible. 
We are finally starting to see some progress being made in the debate over coronavirus financial relief on Capitol Hill. This as talks drag on for a 10th day. Both Republicans and Democrats have made concessions with their demands, with the Trump administration team offering to extend both extra federal unemployment insurance at $400 a week and a moratorium on evictions into December. Democrats have cut the request for U.S. Postal Service funding to $10 billion from $25 billion. Both parties have struggled to strike an aid agreement after the enhanced unemployment benefits expired in late July. Less than a week after civil rights icon and 5th District Congressman John Lewis was laid to rest in South Hughes Cemetery. President Trump has made several comments, both about Congressman Lewis and his contribu uh, contributions to the United States and the service inside Ebenezer Baptist Church. This morning on Fox and Friends, he called the eulogy given by former President Obama terrible. I thought it was a terrible speech. It was an angry speech. It showed this anger there that people don't see. He lost control. And he's been really uh, hit very hard by both sides for that speech. That speech was ridiculous. The president also criticized the eulogy the day after the service. Three living presidents were in attendance. Of course, you know uh, who they all were. And former President Obama touched on a, a number of topics from voting rights and access to federal officers uh, being sent to major cities to respond to protests to statehood for Puerto Rico. President Trump now doubling down after his interview with Axios uh, yesterday got a lot of attention and is something many of you are talking about on our Facebook page. How do you think history will remember John Lewis? I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know John Lewis. Uh, he chose not to come to my uh, uh, inauguration. Uh, he chose. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, I never met John Lewis, actually. I don't believe. Do you find him impressive? Uh, I can't say one way or the other. The interview took place last Tuesday as Congressman Lewis was lying in state at the U.S. Capitol. On CNN, the mayor, Keisha Lance Bottoms, says she was disgusted by the president's comments. Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms is one of many Georgians who has not filled out her census as of yet, but the clock is ticking with the deadline now pushed up to September 30th. I'm not ever prepared to record myself doing it, but given that the deadline has been pushed up. Um, it is my intent to do it very soon, and you'll see, you'll know exactly the date that I fill it out because we'll post it online. The move to change the deadline was met with criticism from four former directors of the Census Bureau, according to the New York Times. They say pushing up the deadline, it could result in an incomplete count, and that would impact things like how congressional and local voting districts are drawn or how $1.5 trillion in federal funds are then distributed. Right now, a little less than 59% of Georgians have filled out their census. That's short of the national response rate and our state's response rate in 2010. In Lebanon, investigators have begun searching for clues as to what caused that deadly blast in Beirut. More than 100 people were killed including one American, 2,500 people injured in that explosion. The government there has ordered port officials to be put under house arrest amid speculation. Graft and corruption was going on at the port. The investigation's focusing on how 2,700 tons of ammonia nitrate, which is highly explosive used in fertilizers, came to be stored at that facility for many years. A major political shakeup in Missouri's Democratic race primary, a newcomer beat out a longtime representative after 20 years. Cori Bush was at one time in her life homeless. She led protests following a white police officer's fatal shooting of a black 18-year-old Ferguson, Missouri youth. And uh, she uh, also uh, uh, was victorious uh, there are other issues. Missouri's first congressional district has been represented by uh, the 64-year-old incumbent uh, for a half a century. The stalemate continues between Democrats and Republicans on the next coronavirus relief bill as the $600 extra unemployment benefit program now ends. Joining me right now is Ted Jenkin, CEO of Oxygen Financial. How serious now is the unemployment situation as we roll in to August? I mean, Jeff, it's very serious nationally. It's at 11.1 percent. We're a little bit thankful here in Georgia that it's only at 7.6 percent, but that's still pretty high. Let's remember this. Since March 20th, there's been 53 million initial jobless claims in this country. And the big thing, Jeff, now is there's 18 million continuous claims. So there are many Americans that 
need this extra money every week. And if you consider this, more than 70% of Americans are in service-based jobs right now, Jeff, and the two R's, restaurant and retail, they have been hit really, really hard right now. In fact, Yelp had a survey that showed that 60% of the restaurants that said they were gonna temporarily shut down during the coronavirus are now going to be permanently closed. So the question is, Jeff, will there be the jobs for people to actually go back to work here? What are the proposals on the table right now? Are, are they significant? Are they helpful? Or where are we on that front? Huge stalemate right now, Jeff. Look, the average American, look, take Georgia as an example. People with the $600 were getting $965 a week. They're going to take a 65% pay cut, Jeff. How many people at work, if they got a 65% pay cut, would even go back to work? They're going to be down to $365 a week. So Congress passed an act 75 days ago, Jeff, called the HEROES Act that would pay Americans this an additional $600 till January of 2021. So far, all the Senate has put together in the HEALS Act is a $200 a week extra stipend and then something that would take you to about 70% of your overall wages. There was a proposal last week from Mitt Romney that started the unemployment at $500 and it would scale down to $300 by October. But it's a huge stalemate right now because one camp thinks people are eating Cheetos and playing video games and are at home. And, and the other camp really wants to have this money in people's hands and they're worried about Americans being out on the street. Look, here's the concern, too. I mean, the government cannot be paying this indefinitely. I mean, that, that also will take a huge toll on this country economically. We have to get people back to work. Look, uh, I'm not in politics, but I would love to see an infrastructure bill go into place, both one that's traditional infrastructure and also digital infrastructure. Try to get Americans back to work because, simply put, many of these restaurant and retail jobs, I do not think, are going to return anytime soon. I, I think this reboot may have changed our habits uh, not only in our homes, but outside as well, as, as far as the amount of money that we spend in restaurants. Uh, no question about it, Jeff. The spending is way down, and as long as the coronavirus persists, things like entertainment, hospitality, travel, and leisure, they will all continue to suffer uh, real damage here. Ted Jenkin, as always, thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks, Jeff. Any showers that have been out there tonight are all falling apart. Stay with us. We're going to take you out into the tropics and so show you if anything's developing and give you the latest update on what to expect for the rest of the season. Coming up in sports, the Atlanta Sports Awards. We are going to be televising it live uh, on, uh, on, on uh, 11 Alive coming up in the days ahead, but we'll have a little preview tonight. From 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you 
First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. TikTok is at the center of different debates right now, from app security to oversight of foreign tech products. We've had our Verify team breaking down why this is all occurring. Here is our ever-present Jason Puckett. TikTok, it's a video app owned by Beijing-based company ByteDance, where users make short videos on pretty much everything. Recent estimates show roughly 800 million users around the world. So what's the issue with TikTok? Put simply, TikTok is owned by a Chinese internet company, and officials in Washington, like Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, are worried the Chinese government can access the videos and personal data that Americans put on the app. He said users are, quote, putting private information in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, these concerns have led to the U.S. military banning the app and new bills in the House and Senate that would ban the app on all government phones. So what does TikTok say about all this? Well, they reject the concerns. A spokeswoman stated that TikTok stores its data in the United States and has, quote, strict controls on employee access to the information. Right now, we can't verify whether or not TikTok is actually sharing data with the Chinese government. ByteDance is a private company, and we can't see exactly how or where they send data. So can TikTok actually be banned in the U.S.? That is complicated. Right now, President Trump has given ByteDance till September 15th to sell TikTok to a U.S. company or be shut down, and Microsoft has already expressed interest. There is a legal precedent. Last year, a Chinese company was pressured to sell their ownership of dating app Grindr after, quote, concerns of foreign access to personally identifiable information of U.S. citizens. Now, that is a direct quote from this congressional research report talking about the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS. That's a long name. They're just an advisory group in the Treasury Department that looks into national security risks from foreign investments. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin has confirmed that the CFIUS is currently investigating TikTok. At least six people are dead, millions without power after the tropical storm cut a path of destruction from the Carolinas to Canada. Cleanup is well underway after the storm blew down trees and power lines, broke windows, caused widespread flooding across a number of states. NBC's Chris Pallone has the very latest. Isaias may be gone, but it will be quite a while before it is forgotten. The tropical storm left a path of destruction which caused widespread flooding in Pennsylvania. Got the mud. There's mud everywhere. And it's just, it's just nasty. And brought down trees and power lines up and down the eastern seaboard. Crack, crack, crack. And went, what ooze? Straight through their house. I was completely scared. Isaias is being blamed for several deaths, including one in New York City, where a tree fell on a parked car and killed the driver sitting inside. A tornado right outside my window. The storm even spawned several tornadoes. It was crazy. See it forming right in front of you. It's like, what? At its height, Isaias knocked out power to millions. The outage, the second worst ever in the history of the power company, which serves New York City. The state's governor has launched an investigation into several utility companies, accusing them of being unprepared for the storm. 
A similar situation unfolding in Connecticut, where it could be days before all the power is back on. We're going to be doing everything we can to get power up as soon as we can. This IES is now deep into northern Canada. The cleanup in the U.S. now underway. Isaias is now post-tropical and the National Hurricane Center issued the last advisory on it this morning. So it's an area of low pressure now that's moving up through Canada and it's just going to kind of fizzle out. And there's nothing else really going on out there right now. I want to give you a look at what we're watching in the tropics kind of closer here to us in the Atlantic. And here we have one little system that we're keeping an eye on earlier. This actually had a little better chance of development, but it's not really developing that much. So now the Hurricane Center is giving this only a 10% chance of development over the next two days and the next five days at it's out in the Atlantic. They kind of there's Bermuda right here. It's more south and uh, and west of the Bermuda area, and we we, we think it's just going to fall apart. So uh, we don't really see anything else developing out there right now, but we are going to be watching very closely because we are getting to uh, the more active time of the season. And Colorado State University is a, a renowned uh, research university there for studying and predicting hurricanes. And they actually upgraded their hurricane forecast for the rest of the year. And they're predicting now 24 total named storms. We have already had nine this year, and they're expecting a lot more. We would usually average about 12 for this time of year. And of those, they expect 12 of those of the 24 will become hurricanes. And then of those, they think that five of those will at least be a category three or higher storm, a major, major hurricane. So the problem with these predictions is that we can't tell you right now where they're going to develop or where they're going to hit or if they'll even make landfall. A lot of those hurricanes that develop could stay out to sea. So we'll just have to watch that very closely through the season. The peak of hurricane season is uh, September 10th. Here's a live look in Rome right now looking pretty nice where we have dry weather conditions, mild air as well. And you know today it got up to 91 for a high. Our low this morning was 74. Those temperatures above where we should be for this time of year. The averages are 89 and 71 and we picked up 900 of an inch of rain almost a tenth of an inch at the airport today. Not bad. It helped to cool things down briefly uh, during the afternoon hours. And tomorrow we're going to do it again. We'll have some of those afternoon pop up showers that are going to redevelop thanks to the heat and humidity. And speaking of heat, it is going to stay hot. We'll be in the 90s for the next few days for afternoon highs. And we'll really just continue with that summertime pattern. We do see some slightly drier air coming in on Saturday that's going to lower the rain chance. Tomorrow's rain chance 30%, mainly afternoon and evening variety of showers with a high of 91 on our scale from 1 to 11 where at 11 is a perfect day. We're going to go with the 7. So dry to start in the morning. Lunchtime still dry with just a couple more clouds. And then in the afternoon, not everybody getting hit at the same time. We're just talking about that 30% chance for scattered showers. We'll keep the 30% chance on Friday. And then slightly lower rain chances Saturday as some drier air will be in place with the rain chance at 20%. And then a 30% chance Sunday and Monday up a little higher to 40% Tuesday and Wednesday as high temperatures throughout the period. Each afternoon will be in the lower 90s. For the first time, the Atlanta Sports Council is awarding the top eSport competitor in this year's Atlanta Sports Awards. The big show, August 15th on 11 Alive. And these were your three nominees from right here in Atlanta. Let's reveal the winner. Here we go. Outstanding eSport competitor. It's the first time we've ever recognized an eSports athlete. So this year's winner is Celium of the Atlanta Fades. I'm so grateful to, like, to be nominated as the uh, eSports athlete for Atlanta. I'm so uh, like grateful for everything that uh, like my team's done for me you now. Esports is one of the fastest growing industries in the world. The coronavirus pandemic has had a positive impact on the gaming world. Atlanta is one of the major cities in the U.S. that has embraced esports. I honestly just think it's a culture around Atlanta. I think Atlanta has like a lot of um, influencers from it. And I think that's helping a lot from like for like esports, just content creation and all around. Celium is the winner of the 2020 Outstanding Esports Competitor and says that his goal for the future is to just keep winning. I put, I put so much time into like the games to be the best teammate I can be, my teammates, and just try to win more championships for the squad. All right, the Braves, let's give you an update. They had their five-game win streak snapped on Monday, looking to get another streak going after taking game one from the Blue Jays yesterday. They put together a late push, but the bats cooled off from last night. Blue Jays got the win. Two to one was the final. The University of Connecticut, UConn, has canceled their upcoming football season.
They are the first FBS school to do so in 2020. Athletics Director David Benedict said the safety challenges created by COVID place our football student athletes in an unacceptable level of risk. According to the University, the players will remain on scholarship and they will continue to be provided support. Georgia Tech opened fall football camp today. There's a lot of concern about safety of players. Head coach Jeff Collins says that he has an open line of communication with his players and their parents to talk about concerns and updates on protocols. Instead of getting calls, we're being proactive with the with the message. We're being proactive with the steps protocols and the measures that we're taking uh you know so the, the the parents feel good the guys feel good there's open lines of communication uh so the guys feel that they're in a safe environment um and they can trust the things that we're doing and that we have their best interest at heart i would not want to be a head football coach this fall i would like the paycheck but i would not like the responsibility the ncaa released a list of requirements for schools planning to play fall sports it includes giving student athletes the ability to opt out due to covid concerns and still remain on scholarship schools cannot require liability waivers they must cover covid 19 related medical expenses for student athletes plans for postseason play must be determined by august 21st all right covid dominates sports for the foreseeable future, too. We'll take a break. We're back right after this. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but 
We're going to really stick with this summertime pattern where we're going to see a 30% chance for showers that will pop up in the afternoon and early evening on Thursday and Friday. And it's going to be warm. High temperatures in the lower 90s, 91 Thursday, 92 Friday. Saturday, slightly drier air coming in, and that will give us a 20% chance for a shower. Just a little bit lower. I think the humidity levels will be lower too. That 93 degree temperature won't feel that bad. And then the moisture content comes back in here with a 30% chance for showers Sunday and Monday, 40% chance Tuesday and Wednesday. And then throughout the period, every afternoon, we'll see those high temperatures getting into the lower 90s. Chris, thank you and thank you for watching. We appreciate it. Always glad to have you here with us at 10 o'clock on the Big 36 where news is king. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive.